Okay, so there's Mark and Susan. They're all hiding. Why don't you come home over and join us? <laughs> 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 okay. Well, thank you all for coming. This was billed as a tour of the garden. So I suppose that's what I've got to do at this point is take you around the garden so we're not false advertising on this. So can we all just come on over here and we can get started on things. Um, Okay. I'm Reed Brueger, and this is Kirby Vaughn, and the, she is community, and I am garden. <laughs> Are you going to tell them what that means? What that means is that when we have work days, Kirby goes around and builds community, and I do the work. <laughs> I work too. Just he doesn't ever see it. That's it. But um, together, um, we were offered the chance to take care of a very small space here, pretty much where we're standing um, out to that fence there a few years ago by Parks and Rec. And it had been used by the School to Farm Project for their summer classes. And they had capacity problems and wanted people to come in and take over. And Dean and Parks offered it to us and we jumped at the chance and managed to find a lot of volunteers and brought this space back very nicely. And lo and behold, we went to Gene and said, hey, we did a good job. Can we build a community garden? Thinking, you know, five years, something like that. And he said, yeah, let's do it next year. So last year, we managed to raise the funds and build a community garden out there that had 20 plots on it. And the city was absolutely essential to doing that. Um, they provided the fencing. They provide the water, and they provide the land that we're occupying. And every step of the way when we've needed help, whether it's uh, wood chips or uh, fixing up the water, they've always come through. And this year, when we needed help mixing soil, Mark says, yeah, we can do that. We even got some soil you can use to mix it. So it's been a really wonderful partnership, and I just hope we do come through for the city and the city is proud of what we're doing also. I get the feeling that they are, but it's always nice to hear it. And part of what we've been doing is growing food in this old area, mostly for the Good Samaritan Center's food pantry here in Cortez. Last year we harvested 205 pounds of produce that made its way to the food pantry. I'd come here in the morning, run home and wash it and get it there and they're open four days a week and people in the food pantry really loved it. And it became, in my mind, one of the incentives for more fresh produce to head into the food pantry. They've managed to raise money this year through grants and we've been distributing bluebird flour and adobe beans there and um, we're got the extension service is setting up something called Grow a Row so that local gardeners and farmers can hopefully add a row to their gardens and donate it to the food pantry. And the food pantry itself is becoming larger and becoming the source for where the food is put together for Hope's Kitchen, Grace's Kitchen, the bridge the other places in town. So very slowly and or quickly, um, there's been some, a lot of changes in the local food system. And over on North and Beach, all of this is coming together and our garden is going to be part of that. Now, the best way on the, in terms of water and this garden, we've got a drip system. And the best way to use drip and not waste water, is to grow your food intensively. So what Colette and I have done here is square foot gardening 
And over here, you guys can have one too. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Hi, Johnny. If you can pass these around, you'll see what's going on in this bed right here. And the dates that we planted everything. So we've got onions, spinach, beets, carrots, turnips, radishes, and lettuce now. And we'll add more carrots in here. And all of this will be ready except the onions by the end of June. And you flip that sheet over and you see what we'll replace this all with. So growing intensively and looking at crops that mature all together, we'll be able to have two full gardens out of this bed. And that's really how we managed to do 205 pounds from a very small space last year. And over in this bed, we've got right now cucumbers, peas, and squashes. And we'll be growing things up the trellises. And behind us, Colette's got something that she saw in Colorado Country Life. All of you people get our EEA members, I'm fairly certain, and get Colorado Country Life. And EEA and Tri-State have been incredible supporters of this garden. We've got the Hall of Fame over there on the bulletin board. And both of those groups have given more than $1,000 to this garden. And EEAs has been all aimed at water. They paid for all of this drip system. And this year, they paid for the container boxes. And this system was in Colorado Country Life and is reusing pallets. So it's a nice little way to find another use for something that could end up being scrap if we weren't used. Um, wandering around the garden from here, we've got a handicap bed. That's a rhubarb. Rhubarb, exactly. So this person had leg injuries and couldn't bend over and we wanted to have a handicap bed, and Eleanor suggested her, and she got it. <laughs> so Carolyn Hoff takes care of this for us and really has been wonderful with it. Um, in the plots itself, last year we had a mix that was 50-50 compost and soil, and the compost really wasn't composted yet and used up a lot of the nitrogen. To remedy that, we decided to increase the height of the boxes this year and added at least six inches more of soil. And we're hoping that will create better drainage and bring back the nutrients into it. Um, over behind in there is going to be a children's garden this year. And um, Kirby could talk a little bit about that, maybe. Can you? Huh? Yeah, we took a spot that, where the space wasn't really being utilized well, and we thought that that's where the children's garden should go. So we have these three demonstration beds that are for the kids' garden, and then a sandbox and a kind of wild area where they can just dig and play and not have to follow really any rules, because gardens are full of rules. And throughout the summer, we'll have some events like a maypole and uh, working with playground days and doing some programming with them. And we plan to keep expanding it and adding more things. But yeah, we were able to get it started this year. Yeah. And like I said, one of the things we added this year are the container gardens. And we've got these two great pots. Um, I've got a sister-in-law who lives 10 miles from Mexico, so we were able to get those pots for $17 a piece. <laughs> really good deals. <laughs> and we 
We hope. That's what we're hoping. Nice to know, that's a good way to be able to get yeah. coverage there. Yeah. yeah. And this bed here will be tomatoes, and we're hoping the shade from the pergola will keep them from overheating late in the afternoon. And you can see the garlics are coming in fabulous. That's wolf. Yeah. What's it called? Wolfhound? Something like that? What's it called? Somebody. She's not here. What? Carolyn knew what that was. Is it lamb's quarter? No, it's. Wolf, some wolf, wolf pound. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. We may not let that loop <laughs> or might move it. <laughs> relocation. Yeah, relocation probably. So if we come over here to the patio, I can finish up and then we can go inside and listen to Mark or entertain some questions. One more handout for y'all. Okay, so with the idea of promoting gardening here in the city, one of the things that was lacking last year was container gardens. A lot of people might only have a patio um, and not a yard that they can actually dig up. So we got a grant from EEA to purchase some containers and I wanted to use that opportunity to maybe experiment with another way of watering. And two of our gardeners moved here from Phoenix two years ago. And in Phoenix, you can imagine 120 degrees, hot all the time, gardening gets kind of tough. And in Phoenix, they're starting to use a system that was pioneered in um, Australia. And that's the handout. It's called wicking. And what we do, you got to keep coming with me. <laughs> You've got a container and you want to make it waterproof because the idea is there's going to be a reservoir of water in the bottom of this and the soil is added on top. And wicking simply means that water and soil, the water can be drawn upwards against gravity. And so what we do is create a bed at the bottom here after we've put in plastic of sand. And then we'll put this on top of it to be a barrier between the soil we're adding and the sand. And then we'll have this tube that goes down into the sand and where the water will be added. So the water will go down to the bottom and come out through these holes that are at the bottom of the box. And the water will be drawn upwards. And supposedly, if everything works right, we'll be using a lot less water than this box which will be just soil. So that we'll be able to look side by side, and we've done the same there. One is just soil, the other is the wicking. And the net one of our talks tonight will be Sue, and she'll talk about mulching, which will be the final piece of this, so that the surface of this will be mulched, and that will further reduce the, what would you call it, the loss of moisture, but there's got to be a good scientific word for it. <laughs> Evaporation. So what we're doing here at the garden, we are chem-free. So we're really working on building strong soil. And we're looking at intensive gardening. And we're very much into monitoring our water use. And that's it for today. <laughs> <And> <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Come on. Thank you. The timer is on for a half hour every morning. It's up to the individual gardener 
to decide. Those little red levers, each garden has control over how much water goes into their garden. So we provide water for half an hour every day. It's up for the gardeners to find out how much of that they need to use. Ah, there's no marijuana growing in here. <laughs> no, I, I haven't. We haven't dealt with anything. I mean, we haven't heard that. Hmm. Right. It's been really up to different people. We've got somebody who's going to grow lupus, those sponges here this year. You know, she's always wanted to, and she can't grow them at home, and so. She, they're not going to be the whole garden's going to be lufus, but she's going to make sure she gets some lufus in there. And popcorn. And popcorn we're growing, yeah. yep, for the kids. And lufa. It's a sponge. It's a. It's actually a squash or a gourd. But you were saying lupus. I no, lufa. Lufa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, we had any problems with that, Colette, Kirby, Christine, with people you know, growing things that we were worried about? We had some weed problems yeah. with somebody last year. But. Yeah, nothing that people chose to plant. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're, they're pretty independent with their plots. The only time they have to really consider everyone else is if it's going to impact the garden or their neighbors. Yeah. And there's some, you know, if we had more time, I, I could point out things that each person's thing. We've had new stuff. People came in this year and really figured out how to do partial shade for things. And it was like, that's really fun. But Mark has something more to talk about. Susan has more to talk about inside. So we need to get in there. <laughs> Red-eyed? Okay, I'm Mark Boblet. I'm the park superintendent for the city of Cortez. Um, we're here today to talk about WaterWise. Last year was a real kick in the teeth um, with our water situation. Um, we're looking a lot better this year, but we would like to promote some conservation efforts and continue that. Um, it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, if you manage your water right, you're going to have some conservation um, improvements. Let's see if my slides work. They don't get stuck in the carousel. <laughs> in the beginning, we used to water Montezuma by hand with garden hoses. And City Park was done with quick couplers, as was the golf course. Insert them in, 15 in the morning. Lunchtime, 15 more, move them. End of the day, move them. And then we had a night person. So this is, um, City Park was our first system. This was the second one. This is Park Street, looking south. And that tree, I think, is still here. It's at the number one hole, uh, disc golf hole, at the PD. And there we are just surveying the property. That's the pond. And there, it, we did pump out of that at one point. Um, so we had a pretty vacant pallet to work with. This is a couple years later. Um, the wheels of government are slow. We still, still have the signs like that. They're gone now. Um, anyways, this is Centennial last week. So quite a difference in the, the trees. You can see the little cottonwoods here. They're all planted in buckets and ball and burlap. Mark, is that your old park shop? That is our shop right behind the library. <laughs> we, we upgraded to a fence that year. 72 Volkswagen. Um, we had a 72 Ford van. I'm, I'm dating myself. <laughs> Anyways, pick the right person for the job. Self-explanatory. You know what I mean. Um, some of the practices that we're all guilty of, I'll take responsibility. Water in the streets and sidewalks. Um, there's 5,000 heads out there, so if 99% are working, there's 50 that aren't. So we do rely on the public to give us a holler. If they see anything wrong, we're getting a lot better. Um, Overwatering, that occurs. A lot of times you see a dry spot. You'll try to kick the system up to get that dry spot, and everything else gets overwatered. Um, mismatching heads and nozzles. 
Um, the design is important. Um, how the heads are selected according to the site. Um, head spacing should be head to head. Design, and this is, we've got so many good landscapers and irrigation people in town. They're the ones that are gonna be doing design most likely. Um, and this goes for sprinkler systems and drip systems. Hillsides, um, you wanna water along the hill. You get low head drainage, pressure's higher at the bottom. Um, a lot of the controllers now have cycle and soak. So when the water runs off, you put too much down, it'll water half cycle, go back around and catch up the rest of the deal. Um, flow, you wanna know what that is um, to determine um, how many heads you can put on a line. Prevailing wind, shade, you don't put um, full circle, or not full circle, um, you don't put uh, heads in the shade on the same zone as heads in the sun. You'll overwater the shade or underwater the lawn. It's Parque de Vida. This was 95, obviously. Centennial's hardly got anything. This feeds the parks. That's the MVI pipeline, and it dumps into this pond. And like I say, this, this used to be our irrigation source for Centennial. There was a vertical turbine um, pump in there. Roger Smith Avenue. Lots have changed. Rec Center here, the new pond here. That's today. And water. We have three sources. Number one is treated water. We do not like to use that. It's expensive. It taxes the water plant. Um, so that's mostly in the so so shoulder season or getting the park fired up. Um, the second is MVI, treated water. And um, that's what we use primarily. It's a pressured pipeline. Um, the third is the pond, and the, the MVI feeds this pond. Um, so we can use it, water from Centennial to shuttle to, shuttle to cross the street to keep it, keep it um, um, active. So we also reclaim all the water in this parking lot, part of Smith Lane, and all the rec center goes into these drop boxes and it all enters the pond right here. So we do use reclaimed water in the city. Aerators, they're, people think they're just fountains, but they're actually promoting aerobic activity. Um, big difference when we renovated the pond a few years ago, we added, added these and this small pump transfers water across the street to Parque de Vida. And then we have continuous flow of water keep the pond fresh. Um, irrigation, the entire park is water from a uh, personal computer at the shop. Um, 400 zones in all three parks, 2,200 heads. Uh, VFD pumps, pumps water, um, variable frequency drive. The, the park is pressured at 72 pounds um, to keep the pressure up, the variable frequency spins whatever it needs to save energy. Um, when it gets the 600 gallons a minute, it'll switch over to the constant and then it'll ratchet back up as you turn the valves on. Um, it's all flow managed. Uh, the computer knows exactly how many gallons per minute is going out at any one time. It'll pick and choose uh, zones to water to keep it that peak optimum level. And we get them all, we remotely access it from our phones and tablets. That's Centennial, we GPSed it years ago. This is kind of geared towards homeowners. This was the old school back in the olden days. This is what we use now. It's all central controlled, multi-site. They know everything can be reached from Wi-Fi, cellular. Um, this is for the homeowner, which you guys could use. Uh, it's Wi-Fi, and most of these um, timers now are Wi-Fi compatible, so you can use an app. And the app's free, um, Android and uh, Apple. So you just plug it into the deal. You can still go radio. We have internet um, water meters, so they can access that anytime. Um, Bluetooth, nine volt controllers. You can use a battery to run your garden out, you know, several hundred feet away from your house. You don't have to worry about control wires. It's all a nine volt battery. 
Jenny Lake runs off a 9-volt battery for the season. Um, there's no electricity out there. The garden runs on a battery controller. And 7th Street does, multiple ones. Uh, our tree farm, a lot of people don't even know we have a tree farm. We have two of them down at our ball fields. Their um, battery, as are the North Broadway medians. Solar controllers, um, they're readily available, cheap for homeowners. Um, these are um, solar on top of these atmospheric breaker valves, and you can install these at your house and not have to have a backflow prevention test. These are legal as long as they're a foot above the highest head. So that'll save you a lot of money, not have to have it inspected every year. This is the high school, old high school. They were really resourceful. They lost electricity when they built, you know, when they dem demoed the high school. So they put in a solar panel and a car battery and then an inverter, and it runs it from DC to AC, and that's what runs the controller. And this, this is a new controller I just put in, and it's, it's going to be cellular. That's how we'll communicate to that park. And there's neat stuff in sensor area. This is all stuff that can be put on in your controllers. Guilty. We water in the rain at times. It's two hours to turn everything off. Um, two in the morning it rains, and no one goes out to turn it off. This is a big savings. These are being installed on all of our controllers right now. Um, you mount that on the controller or nearby, and then the, the um, transmitter's up to 800 feet away, so you can put it in a representative spot. Um, and it also does freeze. And that's just another uh, brand. Overflow, that's a homeowner's installed deal too if you want. Um, if you program this at say 20 gallons a minute and it exceeds whatever you set, 25 gallons a minute, it'll shut the controller off. And um, some of the controllers will continue, they'll shut that zone off and they'll continue to water all the other ones and it'll come back to it and it'll fault when it hits that spot again. So that's a big saver. Kids picking, you know, kicking off heads or, or whatever, just have a breakdown line, it'll shut your control down. Um, mini weather station, kind of the same thing, kind of a cheap ET rate um, calculator. Uh, wind, that's gonna be installed as well. So um, when we hit a certain parameter that we've set for the wind, uh, it'll shut down, and when the wind drops down, it'll turn back on again, which is pretty slick. That's, that's kind of the same thing. Soil, soil probes, gardens, uh, lawns, uh, that'll also interact with a computer as well with your controller, so you're not overwatering. Uh, you get a rain event, um, it'll shut your controller down so you don't have to run outside and especially when you're on vacation, it's nice. Uh, all the heads in the park are being switched to these. That's a cost saving and uh, water savings. These are 40 years old, some of them. Um, these have a better precipitation rate. Uh, nozzles are easy to exchange and they're 30 bucks, 120. Karen, you're happy to hear that, I'm sure. Um, we talked a little bit about Zurich Xeriscaping, um, this isn't anywhere around here, it's just a, a slide. Um, the planting, we're, we've got clay soils, as Freed knows. Um, we try to amend it, compost, manure, uh, sand, uh, the mulches. Susan's going to talk to us about the importance of mulching, um, very important for keeping the water retention. Uh, drip irrigation is the way to go, put the, put the water where the roots are, um, and turf. There's so many different types of turf now, other than bluegrass. There's other options. Um, I don't think anyone's advocating getting rid of uh, turf altogether. People have pets, they like the green. Um, but just be conscientious of how big you, uh, how big you wanna make the area. It's, it's expensive to water it. And the most important is picking plants that are native, uh, drought tolerant. There's just a host. The nurseries in town are very familiar with all the plant materials that are available now, and they carry them. These are just examples. There's a lawn kind of incorporated. 
trying to get away from all this red rock. <laughs> but it is popular. It's, we have a lot of it. Um, just the residential. This is really what we're kind of envisioning for the new park. Um, changing the lawns over to uh, more drought tolerant varieties and getting, getting some of this um, in the picture. Got a lot of trees coming in. This is kind of a park setting. Um, just little pods of grass just to kind of get rid of the heat sink just like this park is. It's a, a business, softens the edge of the building. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with the drip system controller. Shut that off. You can clean all the valves. Um, they're pressure reduced and um, are filtered. Even, even the domestic water needs to be filtered for those. And these, half, half gallon to, I don't know, three gallons an hour. Um, I used to put these emitters on this pipe in a landscape setting and you put this, the, the bare pipe out at the plant, it clogs out there and you can't, you have to follow the line all the way back to the emitter. So now we put the emitters on the end of the lines. It's a big, it's a big savings. Once you pull that spaghetti out of the ground, you'll never get it back in. Try to put these on a different zone. They have different precipitation rates. Bubblers for around your um, heavier used plant material. And part of our initiative in the city is that we're trying to, most of our landscapes in front of the city entrance buildings are already xeric. Some have, um, actually most have drip. A lot of it's been abandoned because of the material is xeric. Um, but we want to freshen them up, get a, a fresh view of what we've done. Um, more, more variety, let folks know what works in our area. Um, maybe then get some suggestions. Um, we'll also highlight some drip systems, how they're set up. Um, so these are, the, these are the facilities we're going to work on. And right now, we're, um, we've got a designer that's assisting us, as well as the local nurseries are involved. And uh, medians are going to get hit. They're going to get addressed. This is just rough sketches that our staff has done. And finally, um, we just started working on this. We've been dealing with Southwest Seed. Um, the two nurseries in town also sell their, their seeds. Um, gave us a little bit of advice. Um, there's a flyer when you walked in. But we're going to try to put a different grass variety in these pods out by um, uh, Park Street and Empire. Years ago, it was already set up that way. They're all separate irrigation, so there'll be different levels. And then so people can just see what kind of what a buffalo grass looks like or or uh, blue grama or whatever whatever it is, I think it'll give people a good idea what they might plant if they do choose to have an alternative. So, any hoozle, stay tuned. It's happening. So, you guys got any questions? Is it just a question on the rotor heads versus the impact? How much how much water savings do you think by going with that newer technology? It's it's hard to say. It's more it's more about control than than it is the savings. We can, when we put down 15 minutes of water, we're putting X number of gallons down. The other heads, they're worn. Um, you don't know how many gallons they're putting. And like the high school property, there were hodgepodge of heads. So they're all different nozzles, all different types of heads, rotors and impacts together. So we really had no way to control it. Now when we run 15 minutes or whatever it is, 10 minutes, we know how much water we're putting down and it's all it's all going to the same, you know, back to head to head. It's, better coverage. It's, def it's definitely better coverage. So, yes? This may be an urban legend, but I, I remember hearing a story that the city tried to use gray water uh -huh. to water the ball field south of town, mm -hmm. and the workers started getting rashes on their legs. Uh, the yeah. Yeah, our superintendent um, actually got septic from it. Oh. And yeah, from the, from the water treatment plant, we carried water. This was a bazillion years ago. But we carried water from the sewer plant, and it was stockpiled. And it, you know, it, it gets, it's completely different technology now. But it got stockpiled, and then we pumped it over to the ball fields. Well, 
no one flushes their toilets at 11 o'clock at night when we water. So we didn't have any water then, but yeah, one of them got cut. And at that point, we quit using it. I think if you were to do it now, the water that released into um, the streams and that are suitable, but it's true, yeah. And now we have MBI water, Blue Door, um, so that is all uh, untreated water down to our ball fields. It's not domestic. It's just regular old MBI water. So. And you said in your presentation that all the water from the rec center is yes. directed to the pond? Yes. It's but all it's treated first. It just run off in the parking lots. It's, it's just like um, the detention ponds in town on the, on the businesses and, and whatnot. It all goes off the parking lot right in front of the rec center and there's a lattice of piping around the rec center and drop boxes and it all goes there and it just heads right onto the pond. So we can bank that water when we have a rain event or snow. Um, so it's stored, held in, you know, a reserve and so we can use it for watering. The pool water ever recycled? The what? All the water in the pool. The pool. Oh, it's, it's, um, it's just filtered and reused. It's, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It gets dumped maybe once a year, twice a year, but it's all just recirculated and, and treated. So, yeah, it's clean, trust me. I know, I've done the pools for 30 years. <laughs> yes? Is there any kind of department that's testing the water? Like, Our water department, you mean the domestic water? Yes, the water department does that. Uh, there is, it is available, but I... They test, test it quite frequently, from what I understand. Oh, it's tested all the time. Yeah, yeah constantly, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and they, they purge a lot of the hydrants, too, just to keep everything moving. And, and our farm, we've got really good water. Yes. With that zero caffeine, what are you, are you going to use a drip on that? What, what are you going to use on those spots? On what? Where you have the zero scope. Yeah. Oh, we'll have drip on all of it. It'll be drip that you'll do on each one of them? Oh, yeah. Well, well most of them already have it, actually. actually. The, the, our shop has it. it. Oh, um, that's one of the demo areas. They were all put in for that reason, for, as a demo area. Um, actually, almost everything, the islands out here had it. But if you're using truly Zurich plants, it's more for establishing. Um, garden's a totally different deal. That's, you know, yeah. constantly. But um, once you get everything established and you're using the right plant, um, it it hardly ever has to be run, but you have to have it to get it going. It's just too too cumbersome. So, any other questions? Mark, is it over here? I get turned. I'm turned around in here. I can't. Where Mark is located, where his offices are, and that's very landscaping and it's really pretty. Oh, our shop? Yeah. Yeah, it's right over across the street over here. Yeah. Hi, how are you? And you have one super employee who takes care of all the plants. Sandy? Oh, Sandy is incredible. She does her downtown. She does all, really all the, sand, the, all the landscapes in town. She's the one who just sketched up these designs. She's awesome. We've got a great bunch of people we work with. She's one of our shining stars, for sure. Great. So. Any other questions? Rokey dokey, I guess we'll, um, Susan, I think we're going to do a, your pr presentation in here. Okay. Kidoki. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. I'm just going to squish you over a little. Can you tell I'm a librarian? <laughs> Where is the books? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Got a crowd here. 
and we've got about 15 20 minutes so this is going to be a fast and furious mulch talk so tune in okay <laughs> um, I'm Sue Shamel and um, my husband and I moved here about a year ago from Wyoming and um, yeah a lot of folks want to say oh man Cortez has got quite the conditions to work under well come from that and so therefore this is kind of an, a continuation of it and so therefore um, a long time ago um, I started out with lasagna gardening and this book is at the library, but it's also, you know, around and about if you want to get a hold of one. Um, it advocates sheet mulching. Sheet mulching to me is like the answer to every gardener's prayer. And it makes um, a total um, uh, dropout in composting, like I am, um, into a great gardener. Because you're doing your mulching in the garden, you let your, you let your plants do the thinking. They, they get to do their own... Um, they get to do their own way of growing and all you do is provide all of the nutrients and you do it according to um, layering and you're doing your layering in the beds and so I was looking at the beds out here and I'm trying to apply it to your gardens and I notice there's straw out there I notice um, there's uh, straw okay and so therefore, I think you've gotten that to stick, despite the fact that I understand you get wind uh, rather fiercely up here. And so um, by running string across your beds, and that's a way to start it. But in my opinion, straw doesn't break down near as, as um, nicely as alfalfa. Alfalfa's got all of that great leaf in it, and it's also, it's kind of woven together. And you can break it apart in order to facilitate seed growth if you're going to put in a seed bed but um, it also clumps around the tomato so that you can keep the, t the tomato eggplant peppers whatever you can keep them all um, uh, wet with your um, water system that you have out there currently and so therefore um, it seems like there's some some good things going on out there that I, I really like and I told Reed already and uh, as well as Kirby, that I really like the idea of the sand in the walkways versus the wood. Now, the wood does break down, and eventually you can take that and put it up on top of the bed, and it's going to be a great addition to a sheet mulched bed. But um, in the meantime, um, you can put that sand down, and if it's coarse sand, then um, the, just the act of a lot of people walking on that sand keeps your weeds shaved off essentially and um, you don't end up you know having to do sprays having to do all of that digging and cussing and high you know the height of summer you're not going to be out there thinking the weeds are taller than anybody or you lost a child in there and so therefore um, I like the idea of the sand in the walkways and I like it um, if it's not even sand maybe a little bit coarser but um, it is a it is a way to address that weed problem and then also kind of keep everything, um, uh, what do you want to say, um, trying to keep the moisture out of it because it does heat up and it does, you're going to get a lot of heat obviously from the southerly exposure here and um, it is going to heat but it's not going to let your beds heat up and so you're still doing fine but it's still, um, anyway, uh, the other thing that I like to do, um, anybody heard of a weed dragon? <laughs> weed dragon. <laughs> cool thing. City would love this. <laughs> Anybody loves it. Man, woman, ch don't give it to children. But anyway, <laughs> it's a propane bottle and you have a, a wand off to the side and it has a small, it has a short wand and it ha also has a lo long wand. And of course you're burning off the, you're not burning the weeds off. You're simply taking the top skin of the weed off and it dehydrates and goes away, including bindweed. And so you think, um, yeah, <laughs> bindweed goes under the surface of the, the soil and is pretty, it's a pretty tough customer. But once the bindweed gets this constant attack with the weed dragon, bindweed goes away. It's lovely. Is that a brand name or is it? It's a brand name. I, yeah, because I think I remember when we used to live in Washington for a few years and people had these plain weeders. There you go. You can use it in the winter time for your sidewalk. No, no. You have to wait until like it all turns, it swells up, it turns bright green, and then the cells burst. 
<laughs> well, that, that's a malicious way of looking at it. <laughs> you can do it any way you want, but es essentially you are getting rid of the weeds, and you're doing it in a very, um, I, th I think, a efficient way, but also I think, you know, yes, you're using the propane, but you're not doing it very often, for one thing. And for another, yeah, you do get a certain amount of satisfaction of, of taking <laughs> care of those things with something that's equally as tough as they are. So anyway, yeah, and that's the thing. With the chips, no, no, don't do that. We'll <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, love the sand and love a little bit of mixture of gravel, something coarse in there. But um, as far as getting back to the mulch, the sheet mulching is simply the layer, and that's where they get the lasagna. And so you are, you're, don't overthink this. And so much of the time when I talk to people, they say, oh, gosh, I don't have the leaves, and oh, gosh, I don't have the grass, and oh, gosh, oh, gosh. Don't fuss. You simply put it on top of your bed, and you keep adding the layers, and your plant figures out what it wants. And you do start out with a barrier of newspaper, or cardboard, no carpet, please. I don't want to even hear the word. Um, you do use those because, again, it breaks down. And with the newspaper, you're not using uh, the glossy uh, section of the newspaper. Wall Street Journal, it's the newspaper. Besides, you get great news while you're putting it down. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, color is fine, too, because it's all soy. As long as it's not glossy, then you're, you're cool, OK? And so therefore, um, yeah, it's great to, to slap it down. You get it wet. This book tells you how to do it. And when people say, oh, gosh, I hate to read books. Well, nah. You, get, you go about this far. That's why this is here. That's all you have to read. The rest of it, they talk about plant varieties and et cetera, et cetera. This is it, people. So don't give me that whining stuff about, I don't like to read. It's a cool book. It's got some great illustrations. And it's a great concept. And it works in this kind of, of situation. It works in everybody's situation. It doesn't matter. And you don't have to follow it to a T, but you do have to keep in mind that you, you want to keep a balance. And so you don't overdo anything. You just kind of try to keep it all in. If I want to put grass clippings in, then the next one has got to be a little bit drier. If I want to put food scraps in it, you lift up your mulch and throw it under the mulch and let it back down, and therefore no more weeds still, because um, you're still getting all of that nutrition, because weeds have nutrition, just like other good, plant, good plants as compared to bad weeds. Um, no, weeds, um, I read something not too long ago, oddly enough, that they talked about them being the pioneers, and they are the ones that came in order to um, populate when we tore up the earth back when we decided to farm and back when we decided to move out west and do the things that we've done to our soil. And so once you turn that over, once you turn the soil over, then you've got um, a situation where the plants need to fill in. Otherwise, you have erosion from the wind, from the water, from, um, you know, you, you, uh, livestock, overgrazing, another one of those things. Um, Anyway, uh, sheet mulching does work for a number of, of things. And so when it comes to um, out here in the boxes, I think I'd like, um, I like the straw. And you have to deal with what you have in your area, which um, that doesn't mean that you use all alfalfa or you use all straw or you use all grass or you, you use it and you mix it up. And again, don't overthink it. Just put it on top and let the plant take care of it. And if you're having trouble with it blowing away, um, perhaps with the straw, then you can do the string thing, or else you can do some netting. You know, they got, they've got pheasant netting that, works on, that you can staple to the top of your boxes. Psh, your plants grow through it. You take it out in the fall, done. And so nothing blows away. But you're still doing that thing of, um, trying to keep your mulch where it needs to be in order to stop the, evapora the evaporation and um, keep the weeds down. It balances the temperature of the soil if you get the mulch right because, of course, it's going to be uber hot out there. And then you've got conditions for soil health. And I'm an admitted soil freak. I learned a long time ago that if you've got good soil, you're going to have great plants, you're going to have great nutritious food, and it's going to taste great. And so therefore, you've got to provide all of this different nutrition. And the way that you do it is by 
keeping it available to the plant. And if you let the plant do a buffet, do its own little choice of what it wants, if it goes down or if it goes out, it doesn't matter. It's going to find the nutrition that it needs. And some tomato plants, they do like to go deep, but there's other tomato plants that like to spread out. There's some tomato plants you can get away with planting them on their side. Um, there's others that they don't like it. So therefore, you're paying attention to your plant and you're keeping the nutrients there so that you grow a tough plant. And of course, tough plants repel insects. Tough plants repel any kind of stress from overwatering, underwatering, um, all of the natural conditions, whether if it be, I've seen some amazing things when it came to um, hail damage. You think your, your garden's devastated? If you've got a healthy plant, it will rejuvenate itself. Given time, yeah, if it's going to be late in the season, you might have a little trouble. But you can rejuvenate it to the point of getting some kind of production off of that area. And so um, trying to keep that... Um, the conditions for the soil health, I think, is just of utmost importance, probably more so than even the mulch. The mulch is keeping it in place and it's keeping it moist. And that allows for worms and all of the other little crawlies that we don't really, we don't really pay attention to uh, most of the time. But also all of those microorganism, microorganisms that we don't see and that they're just now finding out about. They're just now understanding that it's a huge network underground, whether it be the trees, the plants, or the soil. It's a huge underground network that takes in more than just your little rectangle of garden out there. You're all interconnected. Ugh, it's about time we figured that out. And so therefore, um, when I do put down the mulch, I do tend to put other things underneath the mulch, and that is to decompose underneath the mulch. And so um, before I put the mulch down, I'll put like rock dust, I've put, um, let's see, what's the other stuff? There's some bokashi, it's called. And that would be a great thing for the pond, by the way. And it's all natural, and it totally takes care of, care of algae and takes care of all sorts of things that you can deal with in that kind of situation. But, pardon? After, let's talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, what you're doing is you're, you're trying to increase that microbial action whether if it be in the soil or in the water or in the air, in the, you know, whatever the case may be, you're wanting the plants to get a hold of it. So putting it under the mulch and putting the mulch on top, it ensures um, that it's going to stay there until the plant decides that it wants it or it doesn't. And if it doesn't want it, it's not going to use it. But if it does want it, it's there and available. And yeah, presto, you've got a, a great, healthy plant. And if you grow plants with the idea of, I'm going to make a healthy plant, you can bet your bottom dollar you're going to have a healthy plant that feeds a healthy person. And, I mean, who doesn't want that? If you're going to all this work, why are you not thinking about health in the end and flavor? And the other thing I wanted to stress, too, trying to keep this water usage down. Um, yes, we live in the high desert, but that doesn't mean that we have to water the beans out of everything. And so keep the water down, and if you'll notice, and you've probably, I mean, it only makes sense, the more water you have in your food, the more water you have in your plant, the more, um, um, what do you call it, the more, huh? Oh, no, bland. It, it's bland because it's, um, you know, water is, uh, what? You're it's hydrating, but it's also, well, Diluting, thank you. <laughs> okay, it's diluting the taste. And so the other thing that I like to do is put, whether if it be molasses or sugar, in my bed before I put the mulch on top. The molasses and sugar also feeds that mycorrhiza, also feeds that bacteria, also feeds the worms, also feeds anything that's down there. It's going to be a goodie for it. And you say, oh, sugar? Bleh. Well, stop and think. How many people feed hummingbirds? Quite a few people, right? Yeah, we all feed them sugar water. I don't see any of them dropping out of the sky. And if anything, they just, they, and it, it seems counterintuitive to me, I, I have to admit. And um, I was, I had a soil test done in Wyoming where we were at, 
and we lived on the Badwater Creek, and so <clears throat> that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what was going on. But uh, he said, oh, spread sugar like a freak. And I'm just sitting there going, no. And I'm not kidding. It, it did make a huge difference. And so um, with the mulches, I think you can do something with, um, you know, alfalfa is my preference. But you do have to put the barrier down. Um, you don't have weeds yet, and I hope that you don't get weeds. But at the same time, if you do... <laughs> If you do get weeds, then you can do the newspaper thing. You can do the cardboard thing. And then you put something on top of it, preferably alfalfa. And I have to do a little cautionary statement. And tell me when, I quit, when I've got to quit yakking. Um, when it comes to alfalfa, everybody's heard of the pesticides and herbicides and you know, some of that stuff that's kind of causing trouble for the people that want to be organic and use manure. And so what we're doing is... Um, we're putting on uh, some products called Crestor, Tide, or Milestone. And yes, Roundup does work in there. But anyway, long story short is the animals can eat that hay, and it still comes out in their manure, and it still affects your garden. So if you know that these are being sprayed on your alfalfa, don't do it, because it'll take at least three years to work it out. Otherwise, you end up with spinach that looks like the Dickens, tomatoes that will not grow. Um, it, it's a disaster for a gardener. And so try to watch where you get your, some of your inputs for the garden. And that's the manure, too. If the, the, the manure, if the plants have been eating um, that kind of hay, then it will be in their manure. And so you put that on your garden. It doesn't matter if it's been composted. It takes at least three to four years for you to you know, for the bacterias and all the different things, because it eventually will take care of it. But in the meantime, you can't eat from your garden. So just a thought there. So I love alfalfa, but um, I also like to use rhubarb leaves when it comes to mulch. They're nice and big. They cover the ground. And what you're doing is trying to put a Band-Aid on the dirt. And dirt is what I'm talking about when it comes to um, we, take, we strip everything off or we rototill it. Ah! And so the thing that I don't like to do is rototilling. I like no-till, and I like where if you're going to disturb it, do it very, very, I mean, superficially, and try to keep it down to a minimum. Because you are destroying all of that micro microorganism, the, the whole environment that is, you know, down and below our feet, and they're, they're telling us now that it could help out with our climate change. And so therefore need to know a little bit more about that as to the carbon sequestration. Um, yeah, it's one of those things that I know this much about, but it does kind of work into my speech, and so therefore I'm going to mention it. <laughs> so help out the, the climate change situation by not turning your soil very much. And of course, when you're doing the mulch, you don't want to turn over your mulch. Eventually, you want to just keep on building. And come fall, you do not tear out your plants. You either bend them over and lay them on top of the bed and add more um, leaves, um, hay, straw, whatever, or you cut them off. But you do not pull them out, and you leave those roots down there to keep up with the microorganisms. Yeah, we're trying to be nice to these guys, and it's about time. So anyway, um, you can do a green mulch. Who grows comfrey in here? I love you. <laughs> Way to go. Comfrey is amazing, and it grows like a weed, but it's beautiful, and pollinators come to it. It's wonderful for soil nutrition. It's wonderful for putting on for a mulch because it does break down, and it has all sorts of calcium in it, which um, tomatoes, um, they get that um, end rot. You won't get end rot with comfrey because it's got so much calcium. It used to be called bone knit by the pioneers, by the, the settlers, and they used it when they got broken bones. And so, yeah, that kind of gives you a little clue. Um, a lot of times we'll grow comfrey underneath root, uh, fruit trees, and you grow the plant there. And you cut it down several times during the season, and you use it in your compost, or you use it in your compost tea. You use it like, like the beans, and you'll be happy you did, because it will break down that clay soil, too. Exactly, exactly. Beautiful. Um, yarrow and chives. I see a lot of chives out there. That makes me happy. Chives cleans, sanitizes the soil. 
Um, you could have a toxic waste dump if you have enough chives. You probably could take care of it, but you know, <laughs> um, it does. <laughs> I, it does take on a, a whole bunch of different problems, and um, it does take care of it eventually. Yarrow is another sanitizer. So uh, love to have those things uh, going on for me. Um, let's see. It, ultimately, as far as my mulch speech goes, I want a healthy ecosystem. Mulches do contribute to that, but they also keep your ecosystem in balance because it's providing an environment for everything to grow. And uh, that includes everything that we just don't ordinarily pay attention and we don't see. So um, anyway, um, I think we're getting to the end here. Um, I didn't give everybody the piece of paper that I, so uh, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that um, there's some mulches and you can pass this around. The other thing that I thought was cool, if you did, did want to do a barrier, um, you can do the cardboard and the, the newspapers and stuff like that, but another one that's way cool, if you've got old pairs of Levi's that are all cotton, no polyester, you can use your Levi's as a barrier. You can get old T-shirts that have something across them, <coughs> cut that out, and um, yours would be fine, but um, you cut that out and lay it in there as a barrier, and at the end of the season, I kid you not, the Levi's will be gone. You will find zippers and you will find grommets. And that is all because you are feeding the microorganisms and they will eat it up. So yes? I was wondering, um, I was wondering if you could use cotton. And so Absolutely. The big thing, of course, is well, cotton sheets. Exactly. No hardware. So I'm going to guess that you just have to make sure there's no detergent residue and it's just really old. And I don't know that I'd worry about the residue. I would worry about the, the elastic that goes around your bottom well, sheet. Okay, you can cut off the elastic too, so just okay. so you're using all of it. And uh, no, I don't know that I'd worry about the residue necessarily because I think most of us are trying to be a little bit, you know, good that way. Um, the uh, the thing that I wanted you to do is make sure and take the decal off your your t-shirts because that won't decompose either. So, um, yeah. Other than that, keep the plastic out of the the soil. I mean, there's a lot of uh, I mean, there's some folks. How many? Who knows? That um, they want to use uh, the barrier of uh, polyethylene and all of the different polys and all of the different stuff that goes on with uh, farming and gardening these days. All of that, and they're finding out now too that the oceans are getting to the point where they're inundated with microscopic particles of plastic. And we're doing it to our soil as well. And so therefore, um, kind of stay ahead of that and don't put it in your dirt. Don't put it in your soil. Don't put it in your garden and don't eat it because you're essentially, whatever you're growing, it will take it up into the plant and you will eat plastic. So, um, yeah, I'm at the library. Lots of books there. Lots more books at the library. And um, if you have any questions, I'll entertain them now. How about wool? Oh, did you see that? Yeah, there's wool, and if anybody knows any sheep <coughs> growers, get the wool. It's amazing. And not only that, um, there's wool pellets you can get now. And um, there's some, I think, at Durango, not to diss anybody around here. It's just saying that I think they're the closest that I know of. And um, when you water them, they, they do their thing, and you end up with some great mulch. It's wonderful. Wool is the same way. Cotton, um, what else did I put on there? I gave all my sheets away. Mm. Yeah, and then you've got, of course, the hemp and the burlap, which is amazing too. And that's another thing that would keep your mulch on while it's still, while your plants are still growing and keep that moisture around when you've got seedlings that are, you know, in this stage. You can do that, uh, the burlap and the hemp mulch down there in the right-hand corner. Um, that works beautifully. Um, Let's see, oh, wood chips and sawdust, you're gonna wanna put some nitrogen in with those because of course it, it sucks. Um, the, how does that work? You put nitrogen in because it sucks it out, right? Um, the wood chips and the sawdust when it breaks down. So therefore be prepared to get some seaweed or get some fish meal or you know something that has a high nitrogen content and you'll be happy. Part and comfrey, thank you, yeah, bingo. Yeah, it's great. Um, 
Yeah, burlap, I love it. And that's a, that's a goodie. So they do have paper um, mulch. And you can get it in a roll, and it looks like the polypropylene and all that stuff. I don't think it lasts near as long. And I find that if you puncture it, then, of course, you're, you're sunk. The weeds come in, and you just... So I like all the other stuff because they're a lot more durable. I think they last throughout the season. And the paper is going to break down. And so, But use a newspaper. Get rid of those things. And um, they work wonderful. Yeah. So what else? Them anymore, but our dog used to shed heavily twice a year. Um, can you lay down something like that too? I would think so because they talk about people's hair. Okay. You can go to a barber shop and it has nitrogen too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really weird. Yeah, that'd be a little yeah. Just, just, like that. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of keep in mind that the getting the thighs, you know <laughs> if you're eating it. Um, that's the only thing that I would kind of be a little finicky about. But otherwise, yeah, you're right. So, um, anything else? I was thinking about mowing your lawn and leaving the grass clippings in the lawn instead of bagging them. That that becomes a mulch, doesn't it? It does, that? and uh, yeah, so that's I what that's what again one of the reasons that I quit composting because I used all my my clippings out so in I the yeah I just left them there, and of course it helps your lawn from you know not drying up and mm -hmm. and again trying to keep it cool and trying to keep the worms in it. And so, yeah, exactly. I rarely have grass clippings. I rarely do. And they're so washy, and you don't certainly want to put them in the aisle because you'll slip and break your neck because they get super slippery when they get wet. And so, um, yeah, but that's what I do. Yeah. Have you worked with any, like, microbes or, you know, where they introduce? Oh, the mycorrhiza? Yeah, yeah. there's granular. There's also spray-on. The microorganisms I'm talking about with the Bokashi, it's a spray-on. Um, there's, oh, they're finding out all sorts of stuff that you can put on these days. And the other good thing, too, if you know anybody that has a, a milk cow, you can use raw milk. And do not heat it, do not cool it, get raw milk and dilute it and put it on your, your plants. And you can put it again under that mulch layer. And so it does break down your mulch and it does keep on it keeps everything happy, and of course, with it being um, with it being uh, whole milk, that you're getting the fats, the, and uh, so therefore, again, you're feeding all that good stuff. So, yep, and goats, same way, cows, goats, you know, <coughs> anything like that with the three stomachs. Okay, what else? Peanut shells. Pardon me. Peanut shells. Peanut shells, I haven't had any uh, experience with that. No, I don't know. I would imagine so if they're not salted. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But um, as far as your garden goes, I think you're on the right track. I think that uh, the, the mulches, I think you probably want to keep with the smaller stuff so that it won't blow away and so you can grow the carrots, the stuff that's, you've got a little bit more headroom in the box, then I think you could go ahead and put the alfalfa in. And that's the thing that, um, her name is Ruth Stout. She was the one gardening without work and so she had some other catchy ones. But she um, planted everything in alfalfa and amazing stuff. But again, watch your alfalfa, okay? And so, um, yeah, and herbicides. Actually, the herbicides seem to be the, the stickler at this time. So, anyway, um, we're there, huh? Okay. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it. You're welcome.